My name is uh, Trevor Harrison. I'm director of Parkland Institute. I want to welcome you to uh, the 21st annual conference of Parkland Institute. Uh, it promises to be a fabulous uh, event as usual. Uh, this year's conference title, of course, is Collapse, Neoliberalism in Crisis. And I think anyone who's been following what's been going on over the last uh, few months, years, will uh, recognize that that is very much the case. Uh, you've already been delayed, so I don't want to delay you too much more here. So I want to start with the program. I want, first of all, to acknowledge that we are on traditional territory. They uh, acknowledge that the University of Alberta, where we are gathering this weekend, is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. In the spirit of that, acknowledgement and to ensure that all of our deliberations and discussions this weekend are grounded in the land on which we meet and the history of its peoples, I would now like to invite Ron Lehman to come up and say a few words. Ron is the Director of Justice and Legal Affairs of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, located nine miles southeast of the town of Lac La Biche. The Beaver Lake Cree Nation is one of the Treaty No. 6 nations who entered into Treaty No. 6 in 1876. And Ron has been a lifetime proponent of the treaty focusing on upholding and enforcing the rights of the Indigenous nations of Treaty 6 in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Currently, Ron is currently the uh, bilateral treaty coordinator with Confederacy of Treaty 6 First Nations and previously the executive director. He has spent over 30 years working diligently for treaty rights, land and natural resource rights, environmental protection, traditional subsistence rights, cultural rights, children's rights, health and self-determination for indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world. He was a delegate to the second UN Conference on Indigenous Peoples in 1981 at the UN European headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, and attended the founding session of the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations in 1982 in Geneva. Ron, please come forwards. Thank you. As a, as a token, Ron, before you begin, I'd like to give you this pouch of tobacco. It, the pouch itself was uh, woven by Dale Latisseur, who is a member of the Parkland Board. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was asked to uh, say an opening prayer, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. But I was just uh, greeting you in my language, one of the languages of uh, this place here. So uh, bear with me and... Uh, can uh, help me out, pray along with me. And uh, please, uh, no pictures while I'm doing the prayer. Hi, hi. Thank you for your patience. Uh, just going to share with you a few words. I'm really glad uh, to, be, to be here, to see so many people, especially educators and uh, people that are very knowledgeable in the European uh, Western education and uh, I know among you also there's probably uh, my people uh, indigenous peoples of this part of Turtle Island and I'm thankful that they're here too because we have to walk in both worlds today uh, our ancestors when they entered into treaty in 1876 at Fort Carlton, Fort Pitt, and in 1877 here at uh, Fort Edmonton, 
where they entered into the adhesion, uh, they were thinking about people like me, people like my grandchildren, uh, people that are not here yet. They were thinking about them. And that's why they entered into this uh, relationship, this agreement uh, called Treaty Number no. 6. And uh, so to us, it's very important. Uh, our ancestors, they might not have been schooled in the way that you're uh, schooling, teaching one another here in this setting, but they learned from cradle to grave. They taught their children, their grandchildren, each and every, and every day. And uh, in those times, their method of teaching was sufficient. But when uh, non-Indigenous people to this island came here, they foresaw that uh, they would also need to live side by side with the people that are coming here, the Queen's people. Uh, the, the treaty that they entered into. So one of the things they thought about was the education. And uh, you've all heard it, it's kind of a cliche, but uh, uh, as it was written down by uh, Lieutenant Governor Morris, the treaty commissioner, uh, they said uh, that our people wanted to learn the cunning of the white man because back then it was white men white people. Now it's uh, people of all races that have come here to this beautiful place. Kind of brisk out there right now. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I've traveled all over this world, but I'm always so happy to come back here because it is a beautiful place. And you must all agree with me. People from all over this world are coming here and uh, they're staying too. A lot of times I see them when I am out in the winter time and they're just shivering and they're dressed like it's 60 below. I kind of, sometimes I think, I bet you they wish they were back where it was warm. But nevertheless, uh, they still, they're still they still here, uh, the people that have come to our country. But one of the things is that uh, before my ancestors even entered into the relationship, uh, the treaty. One of the things that they uh, had a mutual agreement on was teaching one another. So they formalized it in the treaty, uh, education for uh, indigenous peoples, First Nations people, Cree, Dene, uh, what have you. And uh, so, that was one part of it. Another part of this reciprocal agreement was uh, that the people that were visitors that came to this country were to also learn from my ancestors how to respect and how to take care of this land. Somewhere along the way in the last 50, 60 years, that part was just totally forgotten about. And I think now with a lot of the people here that are, you know, we're in the electronic age, we have these, uh, uh, every one of us mostly has a cell phone, even little children, they got cell phones now too. So we're in that age today. And uh, you all know what's happening in our world today. And uh, I'm not an elder. I uh, notice here they uh, put elder. Uh, I work with elders. Uh, I've been on this world uh, 64 years, probably a little more than some of you and a lot less than some of you that are here. I look around me and I see a lot of people with white hair. But I've worked with elders for many, many years. And... Uh, you can't help but absorb some of that knowledge that they share with you. We interview elders about the treaty and uh, some of the things that they share with me is just amazing. And uh, I'm doing it uh, probably for the same reason that you are when you're teaching. 
It's for the benefit of future generations. Uh, people like this little girl here, we think about them. Uh, when I first started this work way back when he was introducing me, uh, probably f closer to 40 years now, been doing this kind of work, uh, went to the United Nations, and uh, me and a few others left were actually there during the drafting and the elaboration of the UN Declaration. Me, Wilton Littlechild, Sharon Venn, and uh, a lot of them are already gone to the spirit world now. But when I first started this work, there was no standards for me to go by. So we had to learn as we went along, much like what most of us are doing in whatever it is that we do. We're learning to be proficient at what we do, at what uh, we're dependent upon to do. And I was uh, reading uh, what you're going to be talking about. Uh, the term neoliberalism is something you don't hear much here in Canada. You don't hear it very much. You go to South and Central America, other parts of the third world, and you hear it all the time, neoliberalism. Uh, a lot of the people of the global south have a big problem with, uh, with that concept. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to share these few words with you. And uh, today, I have 29 grandchildren. And uh, with one more on the way, I'll have 30 grandchildren. I'm not yet a great-grandparent. A lot of you in the crowd are. Uh, I'm not there yet. My oldest uh, grandson is uh, 25 years old. So I guess I'm really close. But one of the things I wanted to uh, leave with you is uh, you're going to be talking about something that's real in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways it's abstract too. And where we are today in this world, we just have to look around us and we just have to uh, follow on our iPads and whatever else we might have, the things that are happening in our world. So I say welcome to all of you to Treaty 6 territory. And, um, but I also want to ask you to walk softly on Mother Earth, to respect our mother, because it's not only for us today, but it's for these little ones here. We have to think of them. What kind of a legacy are we going to leave them if we continue this fossil fuel frenzy that we're all involved in? And uh, I don't know how, much, how, how many of you in the crowd are rich or poor, but most of my people are poor. And... Uh, I watch the news every day. I don't see the price of oil going up, not like it did in that crazy time when it was, what was it, over $100 a barrel. It's not there anymore. Yet, the oil companies have a way of putting their hands in our pockets deeper, you know, like, like now. Uh, and it's a very good trick that they do. They bring the price way up, and then they bring it down and it kind of slowly comes down. And then uh, we're waiting and waiting. They're just getting us used to that high price so, so that uh, when they jack it up again, you know, uh, just remember about a month ago, what was it, about 99 cents a liter? Now it's around uh, 112, I think, 108 I seen. But what justifies that? You know, it comes from our land here, you know, and, and uh, but they seem to just uh, go along night and day, 24-7. Where I come from in uh, Beaver Lake, Lac La Biche area, we're right on top of the tar sand. And uh, it's too deep where we are, so you see all these big tanks where they use the uh, deep well injection and those other methods but they've yet to prove that uh, they're safer. So I think we need to 
really think about uh, where we are today. Uh, we really need to uh, uh, think about these little children, like I said. And um, let's not just think of ourselves today. That's what the oil companies are doing. They're trying to get as much as they can uh, out of the ground. And uh, what legacy are they leaving for the little ones that are coming behind us? I think we all need to uh, think about that in a good way. And um, I really encourage uh, you to uh, have a good frank discussion about where we are today. We don't, we don't have all the answers as indigenous peoples, but just think about this. When non-indigenous peoples came here to our part of the world in Turtle Island, we had no hospitals, we had no jails, we had no insane asylums. And I think uh, our people were living pretty well in harmony with uh, where the Creator uh, put us. And, uh, and I know things change, we can go backwards, but let's take stock today. Let's uh, just have a look at where we are and where it is we wanna go because we're all in this together. We all breathe the same air. We all drink the same water. And uh, it's amazing that in a place like Edmonton, you can still drink water right out of the taps. Most of the world, you can't do that. Many, many places I've traveled, you just can't do that. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, one time we were, um, we took a, a trip, we were in uh, Geneva for uh, work at the UN. So we, on a weekend, we jumped on a train. We went to uh, Amsterdam. So we spent some time there looking around. We, were, we went into a restaurant and we were ordering uh, food. And then these two ladies came and sat next table to us. And uh, they were from Canada. So they were asked, uh, well, what do you want to drink? Oh, nothing, just water. Uh, and so the waiter asked, well, what kind of water? And they said, uh, tap water. And the waiter said, no, you don't want to drink the tap water here. So, <laughs> you know, um, water is a very precious substance. It's life itself. And without water, we all know this, there would be no life. In my language, in the Cree language, water, we say nipi. Nipi, and nipi is uh, uh, made out of two words. Ni means nia, that means me. Pi is pimatisuin, that means life. My life, literally, that's what water is, my life. So we all know. And uh, uh, this is a great place, U of A. I remember back in the 70s, uh, early 70s, late 60s, some of the students here did a study on water. It was amazing. They foretold uh, all the, the places that would be strategic where you, you can put dams. And they hit it dead on. From that time to now, uh, it's like they prof uh, prophesized that these dams would be built. And uh, it's happening. And I've, I've been looking for that study because we used it in our document that we put together for the Coal Lake uh, Heavy Oil Project. Way back then, they were thinking of uh, uh, building a, a big uh, project in Coal Lake. But water was one thing that they didn't have. They kind of did everything backwards. They uh, did all the studies. Uh, they got everything uh, they thought, except where are they gonna get the water from? And uh, so as part of the work that we did, I included the study done by the students from the U of A, and we included it as part of our submission. And I've looked for that report. Must be here somewhere. Um, if somebody finds it, some of you intelligent people, uh, please let me know. And um, 
Um, I work at the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations uh, in the, during the week here in Edmonton. And uh, on the weekends, I go home to uh, Beaver Lake. So you know where to find me if you find this uh, excellent study that was done by uh, students here at the university. So I don't want to take too much more time. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for uh, giving me a few minutes and uh, listening to me and uh, have a good conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I think you uh, touched on many of the things that we will be uh, talking about throughout the uh, the conference here in terms of uh, what kind of world do we want and, uh, you know, the uh, many of the important issues around the uh, corporations that have uh, come to dominate our landscape. I also want to uh, particularly uh, uh, second your uh, and endorse your uh, statement that people with white hair should be listened to. <laughs> um, I want to, uh, before we uh, proceed a little further here, I want to thank some sponsors for the, uh, this conference, without whom, of course, it'd be very difficult to put this on. The Alberta Federation of Labor, Athabasca University, Canadian Union of Public Employees, Civic Service Union Local 52, Health Sciences Association of Alberta, the non-academic, you know, shout out over there, non-academic staff association at the U of A. <laughs> Oh, we got contests going now. United Nurses of Alberta, okay, come on. United uh, University of Alberta's Faculty of Arts and the Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment. I also want to thank the media sponsors for their generous support. Alberta Views Magazine, View Weekly, The TIE, and CJSR Radio. Uh, and also, very importantly, or I want to thank the very many volunteers who are helping us throughout the conference. Uh, if you uh, need any help, I know they'll be tremendously helpful throughout the conference. And I want to thank you again very much for, for being here. Uh, and now, actually, I want to introduce a really good friend of the Parkland Institute. Uh, Leslie Cormack is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts under which the uh, Parkland Institute exists. I can't think of a, uh, a better Dean, frankly, or a better supporter for Parkland Institute. Uh, Leslie has been Dean of Arts at the U of A since 2010. She was previously Dean of Arts and Social Sciences at Simon Fraser University. And prior to that, she sp spent 17 years at the U of A as a professor in the Department of History and Classics. She has been a strong supporter and ally of the Parkland Institute, and we're grateful for her leadership and support. Please help me welcome Leslie to the mic to bring greetings on behalf of the Faculty of Arts. Thank you. He's just trying to butter me up, so I'll give them money. Uh, good. Just to try. <laughs> exactly. Well, good evening, everyone. It's always such a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Faculty of Arts to welcome you to the Parkland Institute's uh, 21st annual conference. Hard to believe it's been 21 years, is it? It's, it? it's gone by so fast. So much has changed, and yet so much has not changed. So uh, these are always such important conferences to think about where we could go, what we could do. Every year, the Parkland Institute organizes such a fabulous weekend of thought-provoking speakers and informed debate. Uh, the amazing program for this year, for 2017, promises, I think, to continue in that tradition. So I have to say, the last six months, it's been a hell of a time, eh? I, I feel like it's maybe not quite the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but we've had famine and flood and fire, uh, nativism, protectionism, the alt-right, uh, international saber-rattling, saber uh, a somewhat rudderless state to the south. Uh, we have race riots, which, as a historian, did make me at least feel like History actually matters in the moment now. It's not just something we think of in the past. It actually matters why you put up statues and why you take down statues. So that's, that's, a, that's a good moment, even as just terrible things have been happening all over the place. Things might seem like a mess, but thankfully, 
we have the Parkland Institute. Uh, we, we, this is exactly the kind of pro problems that the Parkland Institute, and I like to think the Faculty of Arts, uh, need to tackle and do tackle on an ongoing basis. The topic of today's conference, neoliberalism in decline, couldn't, I think, be timelier uh, or more critical to our understanding of the fundamental challenges that we face globally and also here in Canada and in Alberta. The prevalence and the complexity of these challenges demonstrate why the work of the Parkland Institute is so critical. If it was easy, we could all just say what, it's gonna, what we need to do and go home, but it turns out that it's a very complex set of questions and set of problems. Through the events and publications and media reports, Parkland provides government, academics and the general public with the information they need to make responsible and informed decisions as they wade through the quagmires of the 21st century. Indeed, I, I really do feel that the Parkland Institute has been a great source of pride for the Faculty of Arts over 21 years, even at moments when I was backed into a corner that said, well, if you ever want the government of Alberta to give you more money, you better close the Parkland Institute. <laughs> Didn't happen. Uh, so, there you go. <laughs> the Parkland produces high quality research, consistently produces such research, and uh, I think we really, I really honor it for the way in which it engages with the public and enables the informed debate that democracies require. The many people who are involved as members, as donors, researchers, board members, who attend events, as all of you have done tonight, are a testament, I think, to the value that people place on Parkland's role in enriching the public discourse in Alberta and beyond. That's right. Thank you. I think you know that part of the reason that the Institute is, is so well respected and so influential in both political and non-political circles is because it is not just an academic body. This is a collaborative and an interdisciplinary place. It welcomes input and it insists on input and participation from community leaders, business representatives, students, people in the community who have an unwavering effort to bring critical thinking to public policy discourse in this province. As some of you may know, last year, the University of Alberta's Board of Governors approved their new institutional strategic plan, which they called for the public good. For the public good. Think about it. The Parkland Institute is the very embodiment of that mandate. Without question, we're all better informed and more engaged citizens because of Parkland's dedication to democratic debate in this country. I want to thank Trevor, Trevor Harrison and the whole team at the Institute for their diligence in making this weekend happen. And of course, a big thank you just as Trevor gave to the volunteers who will be ensuring that everything runs smoothly. Any of you, and I'm sure there's many of you in this room that have organized events such as this, and you know that, that it's like that swan that looks uh, serene on the surface because he's paddling so desperately under the, under the water. So if it all goes well, you know that there are volunteers who are tearing their hair out at every, uh, at every moment, but I'm sure it will go very smoothly. <laughs> Finally, if any of you are Parkland donors in attendance tonight, I do want to offer you my gratitude. It's because of you that the Institute continues to do its important work. I know that you're, you didn't actually come here to hear me, and that you're all eager as I am to hear Linda McQuaig. So I want to hand the microphone back to Dr. Harrison and to congratulate him and all of you in advance for what I know will be an excellent, thought-provoking, and critically important weekend of conference going. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leslie. I am. Uh, I would point out that uh, among the uh, various catastrophes that have hit us, no locusts yet. Okay, so I, that's good. Um, so, uh, Leslie has already uh, pointed out the fact that uh, we can't do this work without your support. 
You've been fabulous over the years. I know that you'll continue to do so. I just ask that you really uh, try to up the ante, if you like, uh, and support us even more because truly our research is not possible without the support of a lot of people in the community. We are the smallest institute probably in the entire world that does this kind of research, and we are truly a community-based institute. We do all of the work based on very small donations from a lot of people, and that means we also get our ideas from a lot of people as a result. You are important to us. You are, in fact, the basis of why our institute is able to function as it is, and I thank you for your support to this point. Thank you. For those of you who have not registered so far for the conference, I just want to point out uh, that uh, if you're interested in coming to some individual sessions, tickets will still be available at the door. You can also register still for the full conference. If, you've, uh, uh, if at present you canceled your ticket for tonight's session, we'll take $15 off the cost of that full registration. If you have any questions about the conference, please ask one of the volunteers again. Again, uh, you came here this evening not to listen to me, for sure, uh, and uh, you do want to listen to Linda McQuaig, so I'm going to very briefly introduce Linda. Uh, I was, as I picked up Linda today from the airport and we were driving in having a fabulous discussion about, of course, Donald Trump came up in the conversation <laughs> somewhere there. But I was actually reflecting back on, on a very particular moment when I first became aware of uh, Linda's work. It was actually with the, uh, uh, the wealthy barber's wife, uh, came out in 1993, and I was, I was aware of some of Linda's work beforehand, but I remember reading that book, and I think I read it right through, didn't put it down. I was just amazed. And I remember actually handing it over to my wife and saying, you have to read this. This is amazing. Like, it was just so incredibly powerful and described uh, in a way that, that just captured the imagination of what was going on. And then afterwards, of course, shooting the hippo was even more. I mean, from the first page, it was like, wow, this could be a movie, a tragic movie, but, you know, a movie nonetheless. And she's continued to do incredible work since that time. Linda McQuaig has been a longtime friend of Parkland Institute. Uh, and I want to point out, actually, in fact, she is a current uh, uh, member, she is one of our research fellows at the Institute, and we're very pleased to have her in that position. We're thrilled to have her back here in Edmonton. As a journalist and best-selling author, she has a reputation for challenging the establishment and the status quo. As a Globe and Mail reporter, she won a National Newspaper Award in 1989 for a series of articles which sparked a public inquiry and led to the imprisonment of Ontario political lobbyist Patty Starr. As a senior writer for McLean's Magazine, McQuaig probed the early business dealings of Conrad Black in two provocative cover stories. All angry and angry Black suggested on CBC Radio that McQuaig should be horsewhipped. I would take that as a, you know, kind of a, a badge of honor for sure. She has been a rare voice of dissent in the mainstream media. Since 2002, she has used her op-ed column in the Toronto Star to challenge the prevailing economic dogma, take on powerful business moguls, and consistently champion a more equal and inclusive society. As an NDP candidate in the 2015 federal election, Linda McQuaig was denounced by Stephen Harper after she stated on CBC television that much of the oil from the oil sands would have to stay in the ground if Canada is to meet its climate change targets. I should mention that uh, Linda also was uh, telling me about her experiences as a, a candidate in 2015. I don't know if you want to deal with that this evening as well. She's the author of several, seven controversial national bestsellers, including Sh Shooting the Hippo, Death of, by Deficit, and Other Canadian Myths, which was recently selected one of the top 25 books of the past 25 years by the Literary Review of Canada. Her most recent book, co-written with Neil Brooks, is The Trouble with Billionaires, How the Super Rich Hijacked the World and How We Can Take It Back. With no more ado, I want to welcome Linda McQuaig to speak to us this evening. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you for those very kind words. It is, in fact, a great pleasure to be back at the Parkland Institute. I definitely consider myself a friend as well as an associate, longtime friend of the Parkland Institute. Uh, in fact, you know, it's kind of interesting because Alberta, of course, is now a mecca for progressives. <laughs> But some of you are old enough to remember it wasn't always this way. <laughs> and in those long, dark, cold days of conservative rule, there was always one beacon of light, the Parkland Institute, <laughs> that <laughs> kept alive learning and civilization through those dark times. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes, also there was Bill uh, Moore, Kilgallen at Alberta Public Interest, and Kevin Taft, and, and probably everyone else in this room, for that matter. <laughs> anyway, it, it, it is always a, a pleasure as well to speak to a progressive audience like this. Um, from time to time, in, I'm invited to speak to groups that aren't so progressive. I always find that a little different. Uh, to begin with, they never get the concept of, you know, my most recent book, The Trouble with Billionaires. They, you know, they don't get, like, what's the trouble, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, they kind of have a good image of billionaires. I mean, and it's not hard to imagine why. There's tons of books out there about billionaires and the new rich, and they all tend to be kind of flattering how great these guys are, how generous their philanthropy, their philanthropy, how uh, glittering their lives. And I, I guess I just want to clarify that the book I wrote about billionaires with Neil Brooks, it, it's a little different. <laughs> I, I guess the simplest way I can describe the difference is to say it's, it's more in line with the spirit of the protesters who marched down Wall Street right after the 2008 crash, carrying a placard that said, jump, you fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so our, our book fits more into the jump, you fuckers genre of books about the new rich. Uh, now, of course, it's also extremely exciting to be part of a conference in which the title has both neoliberalism and collapse in the same sentence. <laughs> like this is kind of the moment we've all been waiting for, right? But at the same time, I don't need to tell you, something feels maybe a little bit off, a little bit worrisome. I mean, what is it that's bringing down neoliberalism and what is gonna replace it? And of course, if you listen to the media, you'd get the impression that this is all about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a populist out there challenging the elites. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the appropriate response, of course. <laughs> but that, this is said constantly every day on TV, right? Uh, and, but, you know, tr and Trump, of course, encourages this idea, suggesting that he's representing the ordinary people and he's taking on the elites. Of course, the elites he has, has in mind are people's, people like scientists, teachers, <laughs> journalists, you know? When we know that the real elites, of course, are the corporations, the billionaires, the people that actually control this world. Uh, and Trump is, of course, not challenging them at all. Trump is, in fact, very much a part of that elite and very much serving their interests. Uh, you know, the simple truth we all know is Trump has absolutely nothing to offer ordinary people, and he's trying to turn ordinary people and their anger against immigrants, against minorities. Uh, you know, this, this is a real ugly distortion of, of true populism. And I thought, I just want to quickly kind of outline a little bit about populism, because the real populism has an honorable tradition. You know, the real populism, it was a feisty, spirited, popular movement in the late 1800s uh, in the United States and to some extent in Canada. 
And it actually did represent the interests of ordinary people, and it did actually challenge the elites. And I thought maybe I'd just um, give you a quick flavor to remind us of what the true populism is all about. Uh, an example is in the 1890s, there was a plan to introduce an income tax in the United States. They didn't have an income tax. And as a result, revenue was raised primarily through the tariff, which was very regressive. So there was this plan to introduce an income tax, and that prompted 400 of the richest corporate barons in the United States to threaten to leave. They said, if this income tax is implemented, we're going to pack up and leave and take our fortunes with us. You know, we hear, of course, still this kind of thing today about, you know, corporations will leave if, uh, you know, if the certain tax is implemented. And there's a tendency by our political leaders today to capitulate, to kind of give in to them, to lower the tax. But that wasn't the way it was with the, the populace. The, you know, there was no capitulating, for instance, with William Jennings Bryan who was the populist leader in the 1890s. He denounced those 400 businessmen. I just want to quote briefly from a wonderful, rousing speech he gave to the US Congress and just what a model it could be if only we could follow this kind of thinking today. He said, we can better afford to lose these 400 men and their fortunes then risk the contaminating influence of their presence. <laughs> Let them depart, and as they leave without regret the land of their birth, let them go with the poet's curse ringing in their ears. <laughs> That's the way to stand up to the elites. That's what we want to hear. Uh, now, I want to say one thing the election of Trump has done. I think, well, it's <laughs> done many things, but <laughs> one thing it, it, that, that's significant is that it's identified perhaps the depth of dissatisfaction among a lot of ordinary people. And, you know, <laughs> the truth is there's good reason for that dissatisfaction. There's a le legitimate grievances that ordinary people have. Uh, and basically, I'm going to identify the, that legitimate grievance as the fact that over the last few decades, we've seen a massive transfer of income and wealth from ordinary people to the people at the top. So in fact, the popular anger shouldn't be against immigrants and minorities who aren't benefiting from that at all. It should, of course, be against the billionaires and the corporations that, in fact, have orchestrated that change. Uh, let, let me just describe a little bit what I mean by massive transfer, you know, and the, about the rich getting so rich these days. I mean, it's interesting because I think there's a tendency to think well, the rich always get richer. They're just, you know, continuing to get richer. In fact, that, that is wrong. The rich don't always get richer. In fact, there was a period, the early post-war period, where the rich were not getting richer. Everybody else was getting richer at the expense of the rich, but the rich were not actually getting richer. In fact, that era, that early post-war era was a very significant achievement. It was, in fact, the period of greatest economic equality in modern history. And by the way, if this sounds like some far-off utopia, um, well, let me ask, anyone here born before 1980? <laughs> Okay, one, one or two of you. Okay, well, okay, so you lived in this period of much greater economic equality, this post-war era. I mean, it was very different than, it, than today, both in the United States and in Canada. I mean, it came right after a period, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, of, you know, rising inequality, the robber barons, all that kind of thing. 
uh, great poverty and inequality. Uh, but then after the Second World War, things fundamentally changed. For one thing, the Second World War had given people a really strong faith in government. Government had really done well by the country in the Second World War. It basically won the war. There was tremendous respect for government. At the same time, unions were, were organizing and getting strong. And, the, and what ended up happening was the pressure from those that union, that union action, the empowerment of workers, basically led to the rise of the middle class. So you had a dramatic change that, you know, before, the, before World War II, things like health care, access to university, had really been privileges of the elite. But after the Second World War, those became privileges available to everyone which is really quite a striking achievement. You know, back in that early period, back in the 1970s, uh, there was a, actually a popular, popular question out there that was often debated. And the question was, in the future, what will we all do with our leisure time? <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds kind of funny, but that actually was a very big question that people used to debate. And even though it sounds silly now, in fact, it was based on a really sound assumption that if things kept going as they were going in that early post-war period, if the economy kept growing at that rate, what would end up happening is we'd get richer and richer and richer, and eventually we'd all want to take more and more time off. But of course, that's not what happened, right? The, the, that, that fundamentally did not happen. And it wasn't that that assumption was wrong, it was that the world changed. The world changed in a very fundamental way. So the question is, what happened? Well, you know, the popular belief is globalization, economic growth slowing down, various things. In, in fact, I would argue that those are fundamentally wrong. That what really happened was that the rich started fighting back against the increasing equality and the fact that they were, basically their dominance was being encroached upon. And, and by rich, when I talk about rich, I mean the corporate elite, the wealth holders. Basically what they did was they got organized, they had extensive campaigns, they exerted their influence through setting up think tanks in the media, and corporate lobbying, all that, through universities, all that kind of thing. And what they managed to do was to fundamentally change the public mindset in a lot of these areas and change a lot of the laws. I mean, effectively, they put in place a new agenda, a new agenda that now we call neoliberalism. And we all know what that agenda is, tax cuts for the rich, social spending cuts, privatization, deregulation, attacks on labor, uh, and internationally enforcing all that through trade deals. And they, of course, tried often to dress this up as some kind of sophisticated economic theory, you know, that this was about unleashing market forces or you know, going with the superior economic efficiency of the private sector. In fact, what it was really all about was rolling back the significant economic gains, the significant gains towards economic equality that had been achieved in the, that early post-war period. Uh, and sadly, they, they largely succeeded. They, they have been enormously successful in putting in place that agenda. And, and because of that agenda, what, what's ended up happening is that all the income gains over the past 30 years have gone to the top, right? So, you know, wages in Canada have been, and in the United States for that matter, have been effectively stagnant. The median income is almost the same as it was 30 years ago. Meanwhile, the gains are piling up at the top. And 
the higher up you go, the bigger the gains are. The top 1% over the past 30 years has seen their share of the national income double. The top 0.1%, like a richer group, have se has seen their share of the national income triple. The top 0.01% has seen their share of the national income quintuple. In 1980, Canada had three billionaires, which is three too many. <laughs> Today, we have 92 too many. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, the average CEO pay was about 25 times that of the average Canadian worker. Today, it isn't just 25 times greater, but 250 times greater. You know, and in some sectors, it's the discrepancies are even, discrepancies are even more dramatic. In the financial sector, it's completely wacky. Um, just to give one absurd example, the top hedge fund manager, and hedge fund managers are the top earners of all time. But in 2009, a guy called John Paulson had an income in one year of $3.7 billion, which he made by betting against the subprime mortgage market, and in the process, of course, helping to trigger the world recession. So, I mean, it's hard to get your head around that. So that what he had was not just 25 times the average worker or 250 times the average worker. His income that year was 80,000 times the average worker. In other words, he made the same that year as 80,000 nurses. Now, I ask you, in what moral universe <laughs> is that hedge fund manager worth 80,000 nurses? I mean, in what moral universe is that guy worth even one nurse. <laughs> so after all these egalitarian gains in the post-war years, that for the past 30 years, uh, neoliberalism and the neoliberal agenda has, has really triumphed, and that's been a great setback for income equality. And you know, it's kind of interesting to note, because if you if you look at other areas where we're fighting for greater equality, things like gender, race, there, there's been some improvements uh, in recent years. Not, not nearly as far as we have to go, but so, some breakthroughs. Whereas when it comes to income equality, there's been this huge, huge loss. We've moved tremendously backward. In fact, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. Like until recently, even the issue of income inequality was kind of banned from the public debate. I mean, it was okay. It's always been okay to talk about poverty, but it's not okay to talk about there being too much money at the top. If you do that, then you, you're accused of being, oh, you're just jealous. Well, I would like to argue, at the risk of being sounding jealous, that there is too damn much money at the top and that that actually matters. In fact, the, 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 the problem with income inequality isn't just that there's too little at the bottom. It's actually just as much that there's too much at the top. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that is not only does that mean there's far too much being hoarded at the top of the wealth we all collectively create as a society. They're getting far too big a share. But also, importantly, too much money at the top means they have too much political power because great wealth leads to great political power. One person who said this kind of well was actually a Republican backroom boy in the 19th century, a guy called Mark Hanna. And he put it this way, he said, there are two things that matter in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember the second. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it is, you know, it is absolutely true. Concentrated wealth leads to 
great political power. And that, of course, is a serious problem because it undermines democracy. And it, it's, it's always then been a problem, okay? But I would argue it's particularly a problem today because of the extent of dominance by the corporate elite, the extent of their wealth and power, and the capacity they have for destruction. In other words, they always have the power, historically they've always had the power you know, to change the economic laws, get a better deal for themselves, but now they increasingly have huge power over the environment over really nature and the earth itself. I mean, look at climate change. The, the, the blockage by the oil industry in dealing with climate change is effectively holding the world hostage. It's, it's effectively destroying the earth and destroying our human survival. And I, I think, just quickly, I wanna give you an example between the fight over climate change which is a recent fight which has taken place in the neoliberal era when corporations are so dominant. And a similar fight that took place a little bit earlier, more in the early post-war period when corporations weren't so dominant. And you know, it's very interesting. If you look at the fight in the early, in the earlier period, I'm talking about the ozone depletion problem, um, you know, there's some striking similarities. There, in fact, there's a lot of similarities between climate change and ozone layer depletion. Basically, they, it was discovered by science very suddenly. Uh, there was incredible worldwide mobilization to fight it, all the, you know, tremendous organization through the UN. Uh, and there was enormous corporate resistance from some of the most powerful corporations on Earth. But what's fascinating is the ozone layer story, which begins in the early 70s, has a, a much better outcome. And I think the reason it has a much better outcome is because corporations weren't as dominant and as powerful back then. So for instance, uh, the ozone story is actually kind of a success story. We were, the, the, you know, the popular movement, the strength of the UN case actually, uh, you know, was able to win over even government action. Even the Reagan administration ended up supporting it, and the Mulroney government. Uh, and, and, and what they did was they put in place an international treaty called the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which has actually been considered a great success in dealing with ozone layer depletion, which is why you don't hear so much about that, but you hear a lot about climate change. So climate change, similar problem, but coming to light, you know, quite a bit later in the really only late 80s, early 90s, when corporations were so enormously dominant and successful, and they basically had governments, certainly the US government, in their pockets. And as a result, we have been fundamentally unable, despite enormous, enormous mobilization worldwide, incredible effort from the scientific community through the UN, we've been unable to deal with climate change. It's been a failure so far. And, and so I think that's an example of how concentrated wealth and the power that comes with it is a particular danger to us today. Not only do these dominant, rich, and corporate interests get to, you know, get all the tax breaks for themselves that they want, but they actually have the power to destroy the world that obviously is crucial to our survival. Uh, now the centerpiece of this whole neoliberal uh, agenda is, is, has been the attack on government, right? I mean, what they really want, the, they vilify government, everything about government and taxes. They want to destroy public trust. They want to destroy our trust in government. 
and, and, and thereby be able to shrink government in size and scope, and therefore reduce our ability to act collectively to put in place the kind of policies and public programs we want. Now you see this most extremely played out in the United States, uh, you know, where really some of the people down there are nutbags. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, for instance, the, you know, Grover Norquist, you probably heard of him, he's a big uh, right-wing leader, uh, you know, one of those big lobby groups in the U.S., and he's argued, you know, that government should be shrunk to the point that it will fit into a bathtub, you know, except, of course, the military, that, that part, <laughs> that can fill up many bathtubs. But... Uh, and today we see the U.S. Republicans. I mean, it's, it's almost unbelievable to watch as they try and take away uh, health care from 20, 24 million people in order to give bigger tax cuts to the rich. Now they're talking about a tax cut, you know, canceling the estate tax. Donald Trump's family would get a tax break of a billion dollars. I mean, it, it's mind-boggling just how greedy and self-interested the corporate elite has become. But if we look at Canada, you know, neoliberalism in Canada, it, it, it certainly, you'd have to say, it hasn't been as extreme by any means as we've seen in the US. Um, but, but you would have to acknowledge that cons both the conservatives and the liberals in Canada have kind of broadly accepted the neoliberal agenda. I mean, look at it. Tax cuts, social spending cuts, deregulation, privatization, tax on labor. These are all things. I mean, if you look at the, the Kratian government had some of the deepest social spending cuts and, and tax cuts for the rich. And then, of course, is the NDP, which has offered some resistance to the neoliberal agenda, although I often feel not enough, not enough resistance. Uh, <laughs> but, but just to go back and look at the conservatives and the liberals over the last 30 years and what they've done, the, the truth is, even though they're not as kind of crazy as the Americans, the truth is they have managed to shrink the size and scope of the Canadian government quite a lot, quite a lot. And of course, they've done it not by ever saying they're doing that or, you know, passing a law constraining government. They've done it instead through tax cutting. There's been enormous tax cutting in the past 30 years. And as uh, Eugene Lang, who's a former Ottawa civil servant, as he put it, he said, you don't need a law to constrain Ottawa's spending when you've emptied Ottawa's wallet. You know, the tax cutting since 1980 has been enormous. Now, you may not have noticed that because you're not rich. You know, the tax cutting has mostly affected the people at the top. But what I really want to deal with right now is just the size of how big that tax cutting has been. If we had the same tax system in place right now in Canada at all levels, federal, provincial, and municipal, that we had, let's say, even just back in 2000, 17 years ago. That would make a big difference. Anybody want to guess what difference it would make? Uh, well, okay, yeah, that's true. But do you, do you want to guess how much more revenue We'd be collecting, 50 billion. sorry, I guess 50 billion. 50 billion? 200 billion. <laughs> okay, you're getting out of control. <laughs> no, the, the truth is what we'd have an extra, seven, we'd have an extra $78 billion a year. That's a lot of money. I mean, think about it, we're always told we can't afford things, right? can't afford things we want in our health care and can't afford, you know, universities. 
We can't afford rebuilding our hospitals and roads. We certainly can't have a national daycare center, can't have free university tuition, can't have decent pensions or pharmacare. Well, in fact, all these things are really kind of affordable if we were collecting that extra $78 billion a year. And here, here's another little game. What if we collected tax at the rate that the European countries do? I mean, they're civilized countries, right? We're kind of like us. Uh, except they collect a lot more tax than we do. If we collected tax at the same rate as the average European country, anybody want to guess? And I don't want to hear 200 billion. <laughs> no, but we'd collect not 78 billion, but. <laughs> Do I hear 198? <laughs> no, no, 133 billion. Again, just, you know, well, that explains why the European countries, particularly the Scandinavian countries where taxes are particularly high, have just fabulous programs. Fabulous health care, education, pensions, childcare, parental leaves, free university tuition, everything you could imagine. I remember being over in Norway not long ago, and I was asking them about, you know, free university tuition, really? And the government person said, oh, yeah, well, we make them pay a small amount of their living expenses, you know, their beer money, that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, the one that always gets me is the uh, Europe, you know, they have seven weeks paid vacation for everyone in the workforce. So I was asking this, uh, <laughs> I was asking this woman and the government person in Norway, I said, is, th is that really true? Do they, you really, everybody gets seven weeks paid vacation? And she said, oh yes, oh yes. And then she sort of hesitated and thought, oh, okay, now we'll get the true story. She said, yes, yes, they get seven weeks. Well, it's really nine weeks. <laughs> And so, of course, I looked a little quizzical, and she said, well, yeah, it's just, yeah, they get the seven weeks. It's just that at the beginning of their vacation, the employer's required to pay an extra two weeks' pay. And I looked more quizzical, <laughs> and she said, well, otherwise, how would they have enough money to enjoy their vacations? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, you know, so the, you know, there's something called the World Happiness Index. You know, where people in various countries like they rate themselves how happy they are. I don't know how scientific this is, but uh, each year it is kind of interesting that all the Scandinavian countries are always in the top ten, and it's interesting because of course they pay a lot of tax, but they get such fantastic benefits. And I guess the point is it seems to make people really happy. <laughs> and yet the sad thing is, Canada, governed by neo-liberals for the past 30 years, has been moving in exactly the opposite direction. You know, shrinking government, underfunding public programs. Uh, now, I'm not gonna get into the direction Canada's going under the Trudeau government because we have Martin Lukacs tomorrow morning to talk about that. But I want to talk about what's been happening up until now. And, and, and the truth is we've been shrinking, underfunding. We've, in fact, been privatizing everything, pretty much. You know, the first century of Canada, we spent kind of building up ambitious public programs and, and, and public enterprises, you know, and national infrastructure, publicly owned power plants, a nationwide postal service, a public broadcaster, strong health care and education programs, you know, so a really impressive roster of things. But in the last three decades under neoliberalism, we've been downsizing all these national projects. They're selling them off to the highest bidder. Ontario, of course, is now privatizing hydro, one of the power plants that was crucial in the development of the province. The Trudeau government, well, I won't say too much about the Trudeau government, except to say, I don't think I'm giving anything away, to say they are now thinking of privatizing our airports, 
you know, and privatizing, building all this infrastructure that they promised in the campaign. What they didn't mention in the campaign was that the infrastructure, they were gonna be doing this with business, and much of our infrastructure in the future is gonna be owned by the private sector. <laughs> you know, my argument is we've gotta stop this privatization. In fact, we've gotta move in the opposite direction and expand the public sector. And by that, in saying that, I'm not against everything about the, the private sector. I think we need a private sector, and there's some things the private sector does better. They run better restaurants and design better clothes and make better furniture, all kinds of things like that. But, you know, the truth is that there are areas where the public interest is very much at stake. Energy, transportation, banking, healthcare, education, these are areas that cry out for a stronger role for government and often for more public ownership. And let, let me just use a quick example of, let's take energy for instance, if, you know, since we're in Alberta. Uh, and of course, Alberta's blessed with a great deal of oil, uh, but has also been, you know, subjected to a lot of these neoliberal impulses, uh, hostility to government ownership. So of course, you know, the political powers have handed over the development and ownership of oil pretty much to the private sector. There was a brief period, of course, under Lougheed in the 70s, when there was a little bit of concept of the public interest, and of course he set up the Heritage Fund, which the you know, subsequent governments just kind of abandoned. So as a result of that, you know, when, when all the oil started falling apart, the price started falling apart a couple of years ago, um, what you know, Alberta found itself with was a you know, this heritage fund with only $17 billion in it, which, uh, you know, doesn't go very far. Uh, and of course, I'm, you've heard this comparison before, but it's so powerful and important that we have to keep reminding ourselves how differently Norway did things. Norway, that discovered oil a little bit after Alberta, uh, has about the same amount of oil as Alberta and about the same size of population, but a very different approach to what to do with it. As soon as Norway discovered its oil, they immediately decided that it would be developed by the public sector for the interests of the pub, you know, the broader public. So they set up a government company, Stat Oil, uh, to manage and develop their oil and, to, and then they set up the, this sovereign wealth fund to take, take charge of the royalties. Uh, and, you know, the, I'm sure you've heard this number so many times that it must just irk you, you know. So when the, the whole oil situation started falling apart, instead of having just $17 billion in their fund as, you know, the neoliberal type of uh, Alberta government had. Instead, they had $1 trillion in the Norwegian Wealth Fund. Yeah, I mean, actually, it is something to clap about because it's to celebrate, not that it, it should have been done here too, but to, it just shows how effective that kind of thing can be. It shows how, how important, and in fact, the whole example of the superior, the vastly superior uh, and impressive results of Norway, really, they just throw the entire neoliberal uh, orthodoxy into question. You know, this whole notion that the private sector always does things better. I mean, tell that to the Norwegians. It just is not true. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's true that back in the post-war era, the private sector often did some things relatively well. You know, they, they did, a lot of big companies back then provided decent wages and job security and pensions, you know, at the, because under pressure from unions, those things were real. 
But that world is gone. That world has disappeared. And the corporate world is so fundamentally changed. Uh, and I, I think you can see this so dramatically. Uh, well, we see it in the precarious work that, you know, that uh, work, workers are in today. But I just want to quickly point to the example of the recent demise of Sears Canada. Sears Canada used to be, for a long time, the leading department store in the country. It was extremely successful. Uh, but all that changed about 10 years ago. And this is very much part of the sort of transformation of the, to the new economy under, under neoliberalism. What, what ended up happening was it was, Sears Canada was bought out by a billionaire hedge fund manager who got control of the company. And what he did was he stripped, his name's Eddie Lampert, he stripped $2.7 billion out of Sears Canada. You know, that, it, it, he stripped it out and paid it out in dividends to the shareholders, particularly to himself, who was the biggest shareholder. And he, in fact, is a billionaire, and he's listed on Forbes as a billionaire, and they point out when they say source of wealth, Sears, you know? Um, a anyway, so he takes 2.7 billion out, and so, not surprisingly, the company doesn't have the money it needs to invest, to re, you know, sp spruce up its stores for modern competition, all that kind of thing. So it gets into increasing trouble. But here's what's so interesting. What's so outrageous is recently it was things got so bad, Sears Canada went bankrupt and the entire thing was terminated. But there was no responsibility whatsoever to the workforce. 12,000 people were terminated without severance pay, without a penny of severance pay, even though it was clear this was coming for a long time. You take 2.7 billion out of a corporate treasury, the company's in trouble. But they didn't bother to even set aside money for severance for those 12,000 workers or to properly fund the pension fund of 18,000 retirees. So as a result, those people have essentially been left with nothing. You know, and the response kind of in the media, the sort of response of how we deal with, well, it's, you know, this is the global economy, what can you do? Well, that's ridiculous. In fact, there's all kinds of things we could do. One thing we could easily do is pass a law that would hold corporate directors and a controlling shareholder like this Eddie Lampert personally liable for debts they owe their employees. So the, the, the failure of neoliberalism, um, you know, it's uh, the result of this neoliberal agenda, we've ended up with dramatic increase in inequality, a precariously employed workforce, and a corporate sector that's mostly interested in, you know, stripping money out of uh, viable companies hiding it overseas in tax havens. I, I, I would argue that there's an alternative, however, to this, and that is if the private sector is no longer willing or able to deliver results that broadly are in the public interest and broadly help workers, as it did to a certain extent in the post-war years, then the solution is for us to expand the public sector, to expand our reach over the corporate world, and in many cases, to actually own entities, to actually expand our ownership. Some of it would be greater public control, as I was mentioning with the Eddie Lampert example. They, somebody like that would be held personally liable. In other cases, like the uh, like the Alberta situation, there could have been public ownership would have been the solution. So I, I, I guess I just want to say the important difference 
you know, between public and private. You know, the public, when we talk about government, we're ultimately talking about serving the public good, serving the interests of everyone in society. Now, I know governments don't always do that. In fact, in recent years, they've been really abysmal at doing that. But that's what they are supposed to do. And that's very different than the private sector world, the corporate world, where there simply is no concept of the public good. They have no, there's nothing in the requirements of a corporate, the corporation's directors are responsible to their shareholders to make profits. There's no concept of the public good, it doesn't even exist. Um, so the neoliberal revolution, I would argue, is all about trying to undermine our faith in the public domain. You know, that it, 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 indeed its ultimate goal is to destroy the very notion of the public good so that we will all think, you know, we're just all out there for ourselves just trying to do as well, you know, just it's all about me and it's, there's no notion of the broader public. You know, they, they really want to destroy the notion that the public good can be achieved through government action, through collective actions that we do. But I would argue that this is just fundamentally wrong, the proposition that they are trying to put forward. That the truth is, collectively, we can accomplish great things. You know, the, 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 by pooling our resources through the tax system, we can achieve things that we'd never be able to achieve on our own. You know, individually, we often struggle financially. Collectively, we have tremendous wealth. Collectively, we are really rich. And that's something that I think gets lost all the time. Let me just explain sort of what I mean by that. And I want to explain by using the example, the comparison of public and private health care. And we, of course, have a perfect example. The United States, largely private health care, Canada, largely, or largely private, Canada, largely public. And, of course, we know the numbers. The, in the U.S., tens of millions of Americans have no health coverage, and yet, even so, the U.S., spends vastly more per person on health care than we do. In fact, they spend 16% of their GDP on health care. We only spend 10% and we manage to cover everyone. But those are just the numbers. I want to kind of make it a little bit more human. A few years ago, a friend of mine had a massive heart attack and he ended up in hospital and intensive care for six weeks. And after that, and then a little more time in the hospital, eventually he actually was okay, and he left a healthy guy. And he made the point, he said, the whole time I was there, it was the weirdest thing, the whole time I was there and when I left, no one mentioned money, which is kind of an amazing thought when you think about it. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the reasons Canadians love health care so much, you know, that it, uh, it, it you know, we, in, in 2004, there was a, CBC had a contest to choose the greatest Canadian. Remember that? And you had to vote on a ten, you know, thousands of Canadians voted. And they voted, as you know, not to select a prime minister or a military leader. They voted. Tommy Douglas, the greatest Canadian of all time, the father of Medicare. <laughs> you know, I mean, Medicare makes us proud because it enshrines the principle of equality. Everyone matters. Everyone is included. You know, it doesn't matter how rich or how poor you are. As a Canadian, you have access to excellent care. I mean, this is very, the very opposite of the neoliberal agenda and the neoliberal revolution where you only get what you can afford. No wonder the Republicans hate public health care and no wonder right-wingers in Canada are always trying to undermine our public health care system. 
because the, the right-wingers have managed to purge equality from just about every other aspect of our society. We live in a society riddled with elitism and privilege. I mean, look at, well, today I came, I flew out from Toronto on, you know, Air Canada. Now, Air Canada, if you aren't elite, super elite, <laughs> hyper elite, <laughs> mega elite, I mean, you are made to feel like you should not be traveling, you know? Or at our amusement parks. Do you know you can now at a lot of amusement parks, I know in Toronto, Canada's Wonderland, you can buy what's called a fast pass for your kid. So that allows your kid to push in front of all the other little kids waiting. Think of what fantastic preparation that is for the modern world. <laughs> and e even at our universities, the concept of equality is not taken seriously. I'll give you an example about U of T. Uh, Peter Monk, you know, big corporate mogul, a couple years ago, he donated 35 million to create a School of Global Studies at U of T. And he made U of T sign an agreement. I got a copy of the agreement. It was quite interesting. Uh, in which it was fascinating. What it, what it showed was his terms were that the front door of this monk mansion, uh, right on, you know, housing this, uh, this global studies school, right on swanky Bloor Street in Toronto, the front door, it said in the agreement with U of T, would be reserved exclusively for the use of senior faculty and guests of the school. Everyone else, it went on to say, and I identified those people, junior faculty, students, members of the general public. By the way, members of the general public, through their taxes, pay for most of the costs of the Hmong school. But that didn't appear in this agreement. These other people, it was identified in this U of T agreement, everyone else, junior faculty, students, general public, will be required to enter by the back door. <laughs> How's that for equality? So at our airports, at our amusement parks, at our universities, and just about everywhere else, the rich can buy their way to the front of the line or through the front door. But when it comes to healthcare, where it really matters. They can't do that. No wonder they're so angry. <laughs> they can't do it. What a triumph that is. I love that about Canada and about our healthcare system, that although our society may be riddled with inequality, on this key important aspect, there's no front of the line, there's no favoritism, no special passes. A billionaire can't get treat it any faster in an emergency depar department than a janitor. Everyone's inside, entitled to the same care. Now, right-wingers will counter when you say this kind of thing. They'll say, yeah, but you know, in Canada, a dog can get a hip replacement faster than a human. <laughs> and you know what? That's true. That's true. You know why? Because veterinary medicine is governed by the rules of the marketplace. And in the rules of the marketplace, with enough money, you can get anything you want as fast as you want it. So a dog can get a hip replacement, it can get a facelift, <laughs> it can get liposuction. <laughs> But the flip side is, if the owner can't pay, the dog's put down. So that's the difference between a public system and a private system, and that's why this fight is so important. So in conclusion, I realize I've gone on quite a long time, but I just want to conclude by pointing out that what we Need is not the fake populism served up by Donald Trump, which simply reinforces the neoliberal agenda that we've had for the past three decades with its assault on ordinary people and enrichment of the rich. What we need 
is to revive the spirit of real populism that champions the interests of ordinary people and truly challenges the power elite. Now the bad news is the neoliberal revolution is deeply entrenched and the Trump is just the latest version of it. The good news is that although it's deeply entrenched, the public has always been very skeptical about the neoliberal revolution. You know, despite all the enormous propaganda, business, media propaganda, attacking government and vilifying taxes, the public actually continues to value public programs and services. In fact, polls show Canadians are willing to pay more tax. Uh, now, sure, if you, if you ask them, uh, you know, would you like a tax cut? Would you like some ice cream? <laughs> would you like a pizza? You know, if you ask them those kinds of questions, they'll say, yeah, yeah. But if you ask them to choose, if you ask them, do you want a tax cut or would you rather have government investment in important social programs, it's quite striking. Overwhelmingly, they go for the, the, the public investment. Now, I know that's probably at odds with uh, the story we get in the media, the media narrative that dominates. You know, in the media narrative, we all suffer from tax rage, right? We're all just in rage at taxes. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. The truth is, it's only a small group who's suffering from tax rage. And I'm going to identify that group right now. <laughs> That group is rich, older men. <laughs> now, you may wonder how I know that. This is based on extensive research. <laughs> In fact, there's a, a publication, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it, it's called The Wealthy Boomer. Comes out from time to time in the National Post. Kind of an odd publication. It really consists of two things, articles about tax rage and ads for Viagra. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that makes me wonder, does tax rage cause erectile dysfunction? Or does erectile dysfunction cause tax rage? It could be either way. Anyway, the point is right-wingers are impotent. <laughs> Actually, sadly, that's not true. Right-wingers are not impotent. But the point is neither are we. And it's time that we demanded that this be a country where everyone counts. It's time we demanded this be a country where everyone enters by the front door. Yes. Thank you very much. That was fabulous. I don't know how, how we can surpass that as an encore, but Linda has kindly agreed to take three questions. I know it's running a bit late. Well, I, I didn't limit it to three. Trevor said three. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll see how, how much time we can fit these in. Okay. okay. We'll start with three questions just over here. And at the back, and who else? What? Gender equality here. Uh -huh. I'm looking for uh, right in the middle here. Okay. We can get a uh, runner up there. Hello? Oh, 
Awesome. Uh, thanks, Linda. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm going to be uh, really critical here, uh, okay. not because I don't like you, but I think uh, uh, we need to legitimize authority. Um, you, you, oh, delegitimize. Okay. Yeah. You mean I'm yeah. authority? <laughs> no, uh, legitimize authority. Um, I kind of think that your talk this evening was predicated on a faulty premise, namely the um, false binary of Keynesianism versus free market um, capitalism. It doesn't allow for workers' co-ops, doesn't allow for talks of anarcho-syndicalism and communist ways of organizing to take back the workplace. I wonder what you could say about that. Well, let's put it this way. I agree I didn't talk about that sort of thing at all. I am by no means ruling out the importance of workers' cooperatives, workers' organizing, worker ownership, all that kind of thing. That's not my focus. Like, what I've tried to do uh, is to look at something really basic. Like, I, I, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, we have all this precarious work all around us, people in situations of you know, can't get decent work, there's no uh, job security, no pensions, all this kind of thing. And yet, it wasn't always like that, you know? Like, I'm, I'm just addressing the simple fact that we've regressed terribly, that under the current regime that's dominated, the neoliberal regime, we've had this enormous setback. Now, that's not to say that you, you can take the argument further and say, well, it's not enough to, you know, to recover some of that ground. And I agree. I, I'm not content to go back to where we were in the early world. I'd like to go there and then move on from there. Uh, but, but the point is to at least acknowledge that basic fact. Because sometimes I find when I'm talking to young people, they don't really have a sense that it wasn't always like that, that when people like me went to university, I was able to graduate with no student debt and get a perfectly decent job and have all kinds of job security and stuff. Like, I mean, that, that's a very different world than the world we're in today. And what I want to address is the fact that the change between that world and the world we had today is nothing to do with necessity, it's nothing to do with changes in the global economy. What it has to do with is a set of very powerful interests deciding that they want to change the rules to favor their interests, that they didn't like the direction things were going in, that things were actually becoming more equal in that early post-war period. They didn't like that. They wanted to roll things back. And the, the just the stunning fact is they have been able to do it. And, you know, I guess to begin with, I want to just get people angry about that fact and realizing it doesn't have to be this way, you know, that, that we, we can at least have the degree of income equality that we had back then and how important that is. I've tried to emphasize, you know, it's the, this enormous concentrated economic power enjoyed by corporations today, it's not even just that that's wrong and unfair and everything, but the power they have to destroy our universe through things like their ability to block climate change. I think, I, I, I'm not uh, against what you're talking about. I, I think that there's a whole role to talk about the role of workers' co-ops and how we can move in that direction. That's just, I'm talking about something simpler, something that I think more ordinary people can probably relate to. Anyway, I accept your criticism. <clears throat> Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm going to ask you for another possible false uh, assumption made. The discussion basically seemed to be treating neoliberalism as a form of economic theory. But if you look at the history of where, how it was applied, especially in places like Indonesia and Chile, this wasn't a choice that was made. So I'm wondering is that if your criticism is right, that neoliberalism has destroyed the concept of the social good, I'm asking myself now whether or not this is not a bug but a feature of the system. But and just it, and it's, a, it's a feature of the system. 
so that neoliberalism is designed to destroy democracies. Yeah, yeah. No. And as such, if you have a capitalist system that is fundamentally undemocratic, isn't it, start, isn't it time to start calling this fascism? Yeah, you can call it fascism, sure. But, but, but let me just, let me just you, you said I was treating neoliberalism as an economic theory. No, I specifically said that they try and dress it up as if it has some legitimacy as an economic theory, you know, that it has something to do with unleashing market forces and, you know, trickle down economic, there, there, there's, it's, it's bogus. It's all about putting in place laws that benefit a small but powerful elite. It's that simple. Well, you're getting into a whole different question now, is, is, which we can get into that conversation. And I definitely think American imperialism has been a huge factor in imposing uh, things, yeah, you know, th throughout the world. I, I guess I've been, you know, I'm focusing here on the situation in, in Canada. Uh, that's kind of primarily my focus. But absolutely, the the, uh, you know, like in other words, this is about a power grab, a wealth grab, by these extremely powerful interests. And you're absolutely right. They're raping countries all over the world. I mean, they've been doing that, uh, you know, through the IMF and through the, uh, and just through their own military aggression. I mean, I wrote a book uh, called It's the Crude Dude, War Big Oil and the Fight for the Planet, the premise of which was that the, Invasion of Iraq was all about getting control of the oil. You know, like, uh, so I, I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying. I'm just focusing here on the impact on, on uh, inequality in Canada. Come on, somebody say something nice. This is like <laughs> talking to a business group or something. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. I really like uh, your title, Reclaiming Populism. And um, I think that in Alberta, we have a long tradition of populism. And at times, it's being co-opted by the right. But there's also a tradition of left-wing populism here that I think we really need to tap into. Um, and we have a government now that was elected on a platform of modest tax increases, which they did bring in. Um, but what I've been seeing recently in the media, and it, it's hard to tell how much of that is the media's filter, but the message I'm hearing in the media from government is that they're saying now it's time to tighten our belts again. Um, and it fills me with a sense of despair because I feel like they're seeing the next election on the horizon and they're changing from a populist message of if we work together, we can build a better province and we all have to chip in and do that to if you vote for us, our tax cuts won't be as severe and harsh as the other guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I find that. Yeah. It, well, could I'm you just comment gonna, on that? Yeah. No, I mean, look at. I find that so sad, and this is the problem that the NDP always seems to slip into. They, you know, they they have this idea, and I say they. I actually ran as an NDP candidate, but um, you know, the, this notion that the center is so powerful and we have to kowtow to it. And, you know, that's them buying into the neoliberal agenda, saying, you know, we have to have all these tax cuts, you know? And, and so they say, well, we'll do, it, we'll do it less than the, you know, it's the same thing with, uh, the, they're always with the corporate tax cut. They argue, well, yes, we cut the corporate tax, not as much as the Harper government wanted or something. Like, take a principled stand. You know, I mean, for, for instance, when Bob Ray uh, ran, you may know he was, he was once Ontario Premier, okay? And that was a weird, weird thing. 
Uh, well, well, I mean, it was weird because it came, you know, after years and years, kind of like Alberta, you know, of, of this Tory rule and everything. And, and when he ran, it's very interesting to look at his, his platform. Uh, he probably didn't expect to win. And he had, they had sort of five basic things, but one of them, one of them was bringing back the inheritance tax in Ontario, which, by the way, is a terrific idea. We, you know, we, we, we don't have an inheritance tax in this country, and we should. Um, but so he actually ran on a platform of that. And by any logic of sort of, you know, all the pundits and, you know, that is just a not acceptable. You know, you can't, uh, you can't have that in the Canadian. No, nobody will vote for that. Well, not only did, did he not get defeated, he actually became premier. He became premier, and one of his basic tenants was, one of his basic platforms was bring back the inheritance. Oh, the other one, another one was public auto insurance. You know, like, some very populist measures. And so then he swept, he got a majority government. It was unbelievable. Uh, and, you know, he, he then got into power and, of course, immediately buried all those things, you know, set up a commission to study uh, why there shouldn't be an inheritance tax. But my, my point is that, in fact, those things are actually quite popular. The public never gets a chance to vote for them because no political party ever puts them forward. Uh, and, and, you know, it is true. If you put something like that forward, you'd be attacked by the, by the right. But get out there and sell it. There is no case more easily sold than the, the desirability of an inheritance tax. It only affects the top 1%. Everybody else is too poor, doesn't have enough money to, for it even to be relevant. So you're talking about a tiny little group. And it has no negative effect on the economy for that reason, because it affects this tiny little group. It, it, it's, it's a sure winner. But instead of actually going out there, oh, and just on any level of fairness, of course, it's just to die for as a tax, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, but, but instead of going out and making the case, you know, sincerely going before the people and say, look, at this is, I know this is controversial, but here's why this would be an excellent tax. Because if you did that, and you did it honestly and straightforwardly, I actually think people would listen. I think people would be quite attracted to that. They'd be attracted, first of all, just to the honesty and forthrightness of it and how different it was than all the stuff that they're hearing that is, uh, you know, so uh, never actually makes them any better off. So, but, but anyway, my point is simply that, you know, it would be so great if the NDP <laughs> would actually have the courage, because it does take courage, to go out there and take positions that are outside the mainstream, but take them with passion, commitment, honesty, and defend them for what they're worth. You know, don't try and mealy mouth around it. You know, like, it, 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 to actually make the case for these things. Nobody's ever tried that. I mean, it, it, it would be truly stunning and truly inspiring. And I actually think, I think the NDP would actually do extremely well with that. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. It really is a great pleasure to be back at Parkland. I so enjoyed being here tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>